A good guy with a gun. Special guests, Frank Johnson and Raul Mendez. This is The Loaded Mike, and I'm Dan Wass. Um, I, you know, I got this friend. His name is Frank Johnson. And uh, he is uh, he's a patriot. He's a Second Amendment advocate. And as Dick Heller calls him, the gun dude. Um, great guy. And, and the reason I'm, I wanted Frank on is because Frank not only can talk Second Amendment, but he also made me aware of this guy, Raul Mendez. And I didn't even know of Raul's story, and I should have, because I, I'm, I'm in the Second Amendment realm, but the mainstream media did not cover Raul's story. Uh, Frank has been a proponent of Raul and a proponent of good, good guy with a gun, and I wanted to bring in Frank. So, Frank, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, listen, I want to thank you guys for having me on today. It's uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be among fellow patriots and uh, allow somebody like myself, who you wouldn't necessarily think of as being a Second Amendment advocate, to appear and try to, you know, spread the spread the gospel, as it were, as regards to the Second Amendment and uh, the values therein. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on today. Well, you got a lot of guns in back of you, so I'd never want to break into your house. That's for sure. Oh, <laughs> uh, this that's that's not even That's nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not this is just the display piece. Those are just some of my antique rifles that I have over there. You know, well, there's, there's an, you're never within like four feet of of being oh, able to defend this home. <laughs> always something always something within reach. And you know, and that's why I wanted to bring you on the bring you on the show because we're always talking about you know, good guy with a gun and, and, and how important it is for us to have firearms to protect ourselves. And, you know, and just the, uh, you know, just the idea that there've been studies that, that show us that there's two and a half million, up to two and a half million defensive gun uses per year in America. Um, I mean, we got reports from Gary Kleck, CDC, we got uh, Georgetown University studies that all show this stuff is true. So, you know, um, I just wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, good guy with a gun type stuff and self-defense type stuff. Well, what, what I have found in the years that I've been doing this is when we talk about the instances where the good guy shows up and the good guy has a gun and the good guy is able to put down, put down a bad guy, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's likened to somebody saying, all right, Transportation Safety Administration, they can have a record of all the times that there's been a car accident. And they can diagnose exactly how that accident took place. But then you say, how many accidents didn't take place? Yeah. People say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, mm-hmm. if you're driving down the street and you hit the brakes on your car that and your car stopped, well, you didn't hit anything. It was the use of your brakes that prevented an accident. Now, nobody goes around recording how many times people hit the brakes. So when we in the Second Amendment community try to tell how the statistics bear out that anywhere between a half a million and six million times a year, somebody with a firearm is able to pre- prevent a heinous crime from happening just by the mere presence of having it. The only real time of substance that we can prove that the good guy with the gun was able to prevail is when the good guy has to use the gun in something more than just brandishing it. So when when I talk about these things, you know, I'm not exactly the the guy that people would necessarily assume is the gun gun advocate. I'm a I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised. You know, you think everybody in New York is anti gun and everything, but I also come from the city of uh, the son of Sam. If you remember that uh, auspicious criminal mind from the yep. 1970s. Well, yep. prior to him, uh, he got notoriety because allegedly his dog was his neighbor's dog was the devil and gave him you know tell, gave him messages. But prior to the Son of Sam, New York was gripped by another situation. There were a couple of guys that were running around right around midnight, and they would go into any restaurant, deli, gas station, anything that closed right around midnight when there was a limited amount of people around, and they would go in. (laughs) And their modus of operandi was to walk in, shoot whoever was behind the cash register, The other guy would go around, grab all the stuff out of the cash register, and then they were out of there. It was the original smash and grab, so to speak. Sadly, they took several lives in the commission of these crimes. Well, 
they didn't have a pattern. They were all over the five boroughs, and all of New York City Police Department were aware of what was going on, but they really couldn't catch these guys. Well, one night, they go into this little greasy spoon diner in Brooklyn, and uh, there's only three people working in that restaurant that night, uh, a short order cook, a manager who had just cleaned out the cash drawer and gone down to the basement office to do the books, and a waitress who was five months pregnant. And she was busting the last table, the last customers had left. As she walked into the kitchen, these two guys walked in, guns drawn, and there's nobody standing there. So I guess they really didn't know what to do. But what they didn't notice was that off on the side of the diner in the darkened dining room, because they had the lights out, was the waitress's husband. And he's an off-duty New York City cop. He sees these two guys come in, and he knows exactly what they're about to do. Now, it wasn't too long before that the cops weren't allowed to carry the, an off-duty gun. They had to actually go and fight in court to get the right to do it because they said, we're cops 24 hours a day. Well, <clears throat> the cops won that suit. They were able to carry their firearm. And thank God, because this officer walked he walked around the perimeter of the dining room, and just as he was about to confront these two guys who were armed, his wife walked out of the kitchen, and both these guys trained their guns on her. And within a split second, he reached out, grabbed a hold of her, pulled her behind himself. He put one round in the head of one guy and dropped him and the other five rounds into the chest of the second guy. Second guy fell backwards, stumbled out the door, and ran up the block. He bled out about three blocks away. Now, had he not been there to save his wife and unborn child, these guys would have killed her, went into the cash register, found no money, and went into the kitchen, probably would have shot, you know, shot the short water cook, probably would have found the manager and shot him, took the money, and then they would have left. There were no witnesses. Mm. Now, I tell this story when people ask me about my beginnings in the Second Amendment community and why it's so vital and imperative that I speak on it as often as I can, <clears throat> is that that waitress was my mom. Wow. And she, and she was carrying me wow. at the time. And it was my father that managed to put an end to a crime spree that had ravaged New York City for weeks. And he managed to be the good guy with a gun when a good guy with a gun was needed. So my first breath of air that I took on this planet was because there was a good guy with a gun. Oh and my, gosh. my, you know, my, my mother and father gave me life twice. You know, once when they had me and my father saved my life before I even had a chance to open my eyes. So I do what I do every day because I cannot stand the idea of a father coming home and explaining to his other kids why mommy's not coming home or having to explain to a, a wife why daddy's not coming home. There is, <clears throat> there's an unspeakable amount of evil in this world. And if not confronted by those of us who have the ability to protect ourselves and those around us, evil will prevail. And when I heard of Raul, I, I relived 50 years of my life by hearing Raul. And when he tells you what he how it happened to him, you'll understand better the relevance of why it was so important for me and the Liberty First Foundation mm -hmm. to come up to the plate and do everything we can to help him because he is a God's honest, genuine hero. He's more of a man than just about any man that I've ever met in my life. I'm proud to call him my friend, and I know his kids are proud to call him dad. So well, with that, if you want to you know, have Raul come in and explain to him, <clears throat> explain to you guys where he is and what I, he's I, about. I do, but Frank, I got to thank you for telling that story. That is that is awesome, and I got I – got, chills when at the end there <laughs> that was, well, that's awesome you know uh, you know it, it's it's wild because uh the gun that my father had in his possession at the time that he saved my life was delivered to his ffl about three weeks before it happened it was manufactured 
uh, <laughs> a year to the day. I have the serial number on it when it was manufactured. It was manufactured a year to the day that I, before I was born. And uh, it's it's just I still have that gun, and I carry it. <laughs> I, I carry the gun that saved my life. And wow. I, and with it, I carry my, I carry my dad's spirit in, you know, in the steel, you know, there's, there's a lot of him in me. So it's important that I carry a part of that with me at all times. Well, I, I totally understand. It's a, what a great story. Um, Frank, stick around. We're going to take a short break and we're going to have Raul come up uh, right after this break. We'll be right back. Holster Gator, when seconds matter. All right, so Frank Johnson was a result of a good guy with a gun, which is why he's been so supportive of Raul Mendez. Let me tell you a little bit about our next guest, Raul Mendez. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to a man named Raul Mendez. He's an example of a good guy uh, with a gun saving lives. Raul was at a 4th, July, 4th of July party, and one of the host's neighbors entered the party and started shooting. Raul lost one of his friends in the attack, and Raul took a bullet to the head, shattering his jaw and permanently damaging his eye. Raul's seven-month pregnant wife rushed to his aid and then took the kids into a room and barricaded them for safety. There were other kids in the room, and she threw all five children into the closet, covered them with clothes, and told them to keep quiet. While two women fought off the attacker, and Raul laid injured on the ground, he somehow found the ability to get up after being shot in the head and put four rounds into the killer's chest. We are so proud and honored to have Raul with us today. Raul, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Really I appreciate hope, it. Did I get the information accurate? Uh, two friends died. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the only thing... Uh, Story sounds good, but uh, yeah, two uh, really good friends uh, passed away that night. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, <clears throat> you know, gun owners, we usually we 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 play these scenarios out sometimes in our head because we want to. We don't want it to ever happen, but we 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 try to prepare ourselves for something like this. I can't imagine what was going through your head during all this especially after being injured like that. Can you just kind of tell us where you were uh, consciously, mentally, uh, psychologically during this whole thing? So, I mean, when I got shot, it was unexpected. I first heard a gunshot, which was uh, one of my buddies that got first one I got shot. He got shot in the throat, died instantly. Uh, I was about 10, 15 feet away in the dining area. So this happened in the kitchen, kitchen island first you know the first shot i'm about 10 15 feet away i hear that gunshot i turn around to see you know what the heck is going on and didn't even give me a chance to look at what's going on because as soon as i'm turning he was able to catch me in the right side of my head oh, uh God. bully goes through pretty much goes all through shatters you know this whole jaw this eye socket shatters my nose and takes out my left eye just completely uh, so, I mean, I hit the ground clueless of what was going on. Oh, my God, man. I, God was with you that day. Holy cow. Definitely. I, I, it's unbelievable. What do you, um, did you guys want to get, did you guys want to say anything? That's ah, crazy, you know. Good for you. One chance in a million, right? But you pulled it off. Thank God. That's great. That's, yeah, that's uh, just, can't even imagine. So let's hear the rest of the story. It was uh, the neighbor kitchen island empty bar stool my wife my seven month pregnant wife there was another female and across from that neighbor there was two friends uh again unprovoked 
without even expecting it, nothing. He just gets up, pulls out his uh, nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol and just aims it and shoots my buddy right in the throat. And that was it. As soon as I'm turning around, you know, my wife saw that. You know, she saw the gunman pull out the gun and just fire. And she just, from what she told me, is like, like, what the heck is going on? Is this a joke? Is this like, it was just unreal. Yeah. yeah. So my wife drops to the ground. She looks over to me. And then she sees me get popped in the head from, you know, that distance. She sees me drop to my knees. She runs to me. Get up. Get up. That's when she finally realized, like, hey, like, this is no joke. Like, this is going on. Like, Mm. Tries to get me to get up. She grabs my face and turns it towards her. And that's when she just sees like blood everywhere. Mm. You know, that's when she finally realized like, you know what? My husband is dead. You know, he's gone. What do I, what do I do now? You know, that's like when that light bulb just kind of hit her or, you know, just kind of turned on and she was like, Hey, I got two daughters that are in that bedroom. Yeah. So while everybody was scattering that house, running out the front door, back door, she actually ran to the hallway uh, where she found my two daughters and three other children. That's when she locks, you know, closes the door, barricades it with the dresser. The kids are like, what's going on? You know, because it was just so loud, Mm -hmm. you know, so much mayhem going on. And that's when she's like, hey, you know, she just tells them there's a shooter. Something's going on. Go in the closet, shut up, don't say a word, no matter what you hear. So she throws clothes over them, and, you know, all that. And she just waits there, waits there for that moment where that shooter is just going to, you know, break through the door and kill her mm. and possibly find those children and, you know, kill those children as well. So while all this was happening, Uh, The shooter actually made his way towards the living room where everybody was just trying to run out that front door. Mm -hmm. Uh, He just starts shooting towards the front door, just trying to take out whoever he can. You know, he shot people on the shoulder, you know, in the back and actually shot another friend in the leg. Shot him in the leg. He hit the ground. He couldn't make it out, unfortunately. So he walks up to him and just, you know, aims that gun at the top of his head and just, you know, pulls the trigger and just takes him out right there. Oh my God. Just, just, I mean, I I don't even, I can't even imagine being in that situation. I really, you know, we try to take it on right now. I'm trying to take it on and I, I'm starting to feel some of it and I, but I can't even imagine what you guys went through. I, the, the, just the, just the, the adrenaline and the fear and, and everything that must have been going through everybody just must have been unbelievable. Um, so, you know, as soon as he takes him out, he just makes his way into the master bedroom. Uh, you had three females in there and two other children. Uh, so my wife was like in the guest bedrooms and the, down the hallway, but he actually made his way, which is on the opposite side of the house, the master bedroom. They're shooting down the door, trying to break in, and that's where friend actually takes about three bullets, three, four, to the arm and one to the leg. But she actually gathers whatever strength, will, or anything, you know, to live and starts wrestling him. She grabs his arm where, you know, he had his firearm and tries to take it from him, and, you know, they're wrestling and she's able to get him to, you know, empty out that magazine without shooting her or shooting anybody else. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Uh, When I got out of the hospital, she had mentioned that when this was going on, that she was yelling my name. You know, she was, Raul, Raul, help me, you know, help me. And you don't don't remember that. Uh, So, you know, a lot of this story and this that I'm hearing, of course, came from her and from the other people that were there. So all witnesses. Uh, when I got out of the hospital, I literally had to play detective and just ask all the questions. I reached yeah. out to the actual detective, all the friends, all the family, you know, everybody just trying to get all the answers. But so what she had to mention is she's yelling my name. Well, one of the one of the girls or one of the females I was in the uh, master closet hiding, 
with the uh, two other with the two boys, the two children. She finds a, a rifle, an AR-15, but she couldn't load it. So she actually just grabs a rifle, runs out, and you know starts striking the gunman with it. Hmm. You know, starts striking because at this point, when the shooter had ran out of uh, you know ammunition in his magazine, you know he dropped his gun, got behind her, and just started trying to finish her finish her off by choking her. So got behind her, wrapped his legs around her and just, you know, dropped it to the ground and just was going to finish her off, you know, by choking her. Mm. So this other friend comes to the rescue. They're beating him. You know, they're fighting. They're fighting for their life. And that's about the point where, I mean, God was with me. Definitely. There's there's no other explanation because I should have been dead or at least I should have been out cold, you know, completely with all the loss of blood and just everything. But, you know, by God's grace, like I heard those screams Mm. and I got up, I was able to get up. And at that point, that's where I had to make a decision of what I was going to do next. I could have ran, you know, that was one choice. I didn't know where my family was. I didn't know they were barricaded in that bedroom or anything. So Two choices was, you know, run out or go towards their screams. So I chose to definitely go towards those screams. You know, I did what any, you know, loving friend, loving husband, loving father, you know, would have done. Of course. Yeah. You and know, is, it so, safe, is it safe to assume that you had a pistol on you? Is that? I did. Yeah. I did. So I did have a Glock 36, uh, which is in a 45 caliber concealed on my hip. And so when I got up, I pulled out my 45 and I just went towards those screams. As soon as I saw what's going on and I saw, you know, the whole situation, I just shot. I just went straight for center mass and put four shots in him. And four shots is what it took. I mean, he stopped moving after that. Uh, from what the detective told me is that uh, two of those shots hit his heart. So he died instantly right then and there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was it. That ended the mayhem and actually wanted to, you guys are going to be the first to on an interview to see. This is what I used. Wow. To take out the shooter. Oh man. So, I'm so glad to see you got that back. Yeah, yeah I was gonna, that was my question. I was going to ask if I'm sure it was confiscated. Yeah, that was, was take, that was taken from him the night of the shooting and only returned to him now. So, yeah, uh, I just got it a few weeks ago, hmm. but of course, this is going to be my my trophy gun. I'm retiring it. It did what it had to do. It did its job well. Has that been, that hasn't been cleaned. Has has it been cleaned? No, that's all my blood. Is that blood that I see on there? Wow. I thought I saw. That's all my blood. Wow. And that's probably a biohazard. So after this, I'm going to definitely go wash my hands, but definitely proud to own this, you know, even the, uh, even the magazine. Oh, I see the blood on the magazine too. You know, there's blood all over. So I'm just going to go ahead and put it down now. Oh, my gosh, Raul. But, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I, I really yeah, appreciate definitely. that. So like I said, that, that pretty much ended the mayhem there. And I mean, after that, like just trying to get my wife out of the room was kind of impossible because she didn't believe what was going on. So somebody had came back. uh and was knocking on the door telling my wife, like, hey, the shooter's, you know, it's over. It's over. The shooter's dead. Your husband killed him. Raul killed him. And my wife's like, you're freaking lying. Like, what the heck? I saw my husband die. How wow. the hell are you telling me that my husband killed the shooter? No, I don't believe you. It's like, no, it's me. You know, it's me, this person, you know. You know, it's over. Come out already. Look, I even have, you know, this person with me, which was one of the little kids, and she heard him talking, and so she comes out, 
like, what the heck? And she looks over to the left and looks down the hall. And she just sees me standing there leaning against the wall. Just, you were standing up? Uh, I'm still standing up, of course. Wow. <laughs> she just sees me full of blood. Like she, the only thing that she told me, she's like, it was unreal. I thought like it was a zombie movie because you look like a freaking zombie. Like you just ate somebody, you know, full of blood. That's how bad it was. Uh, she ran to me. My daughters ran to me. And they gave me the biggest hug. And they didn't care if I got blood all over them or anything. They were just, you know, so excited and just relieved, you yeah. know, that I was still standing and that I ended that mayhem, you know, there. Uh, at that point, you know, my wife throws my arm around her shoulder, carries me out to the front. We leap through the through the garage door, and that's when the PD shows up. And so they see me with a forty five in my hand, and of course, oh, you know, they're pointing their guns at me, telling me to drop my weapon. Uh, me just really not knowing, like, out of it already at that point. You know, my wife has to tell me, "Hey, you know." drop your gun or you're, you're going to get shot again, you know? So I threw my gun, you know, pretty much fell into the rocks. And that's why I, uh, that's why it's all it's pretty much like scratched up. That was just from me throwing it when the PD yeah. was pointing their, their guns at me. But at that point, I eventually get rushed to the hospital where they do scans and, you know, do their thing. And I get air backed to another trauma center. Mm -hmm. And, that was that. I got surgery a few days later. I didn't hit any vital organs or nothing. I mean, the only permanent damage, like that's permanent, permanent, like 100%, of course, is just losing my left eye completely. I'll never yeah. see from there ever again. Wow. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know. I... Do they know what provoked him? <clears throat> the guy to come in the house? I don't know. Raul? What was that? I'm sorry. What was that? Do it, does anybody know why the guy came in and started shooting? It was the 3rd of July, but it was friends and family. He wasn't invited. We didn't even know who the hell he was. I've never met him. Mm. Uh, people there were actually close friends that I've known for years, hung out for years, go to their house. They came to my birthday parties and, you know, things like that. So it, it wasn't like, hey, somebody brought a friend that we don't know. Like, no, we knew everybody in that house. But wasn't, so, he the, wasn't he the neighbor of the guy who had the party? Yes, yes, he was a neighbor. Right, so. Yeah, but he he wasn't officially, or he wasn't invited. Hmm. Uh, but what happened is we had gone outside to light some fireworks, and, you know, he heard us all outside, and he came out and just came and made small talk with us. Not so, that I'm aware of. Anybody invited him into the house. I'm not aware of that. It, so, could it be possible? Yes, could be possible that somebody out there outside could have been like, hey, you want some food? Come inside. But from what I know, that didn't happen. He just pretty much made his way inside the house. And the host, you know, surprisingly saw him and just, you know, being a good host, friendly neighbor. It's like, oh, I met you outside. You're my neighbor. You know, hey, uh, you want something to eat? You know, that's when he sat him down in that, at that uh, kitchen island mm -hmm. to have a plate of food. All right, in the middle of eating. Raul, we're going to take a short break, and then okay. when we come back, I want to talk about the aftermath. I want to talk a little okay. bit about how your life has been since then. Okay. And um, so, so let's take it. We're going to take a short break. We'll be we'll be right back. Discover Simul TV, a new streaming platform with over 100 channels of live stream content and video on demand movies. Family-friendly shows to classic and blockbuster movies. Subscribe today and get so much for so little. Stream in harmony on Simultv.com.
Holster Gator, when seconds matter. The media and politicians create terms like gun violence and ghost gun and assault weapon to change the narrative around guns in America. The entire anti-gun fear campaign is built on the reactive emotions of people who don't know any better. And the media seeks their support for gun restrictions. In Good Gun, Bad Guy, I give you the behind-the-scenes look into the mind of the anti-gun radical. Because before we can defeat them, we need to understand their tactics. Good Gun, Bad Guy 2 exposes the media strategies used to create a perpetual state of irrational gun fear and hatred toward gun owners. Good Gun Bad Guy 3 reveals the political motives behind the gun grab, why the left wants an unarmed population, and what we can do to thwart their efforts. The anti-Second Amendment radicals started this evil game. Good Gun Bad Guy is the rule book they hoped you would never see. Go to goodgunbadguy.com to get your copy or purchase the entire series. Mendez is the epitome of a good guy with a gun saving lives. And Raul told his story um, of how he how he saved his family, how he saved his friends, and and how he reacted to a violent attack. Um, and just an astonishing story. Uh, uh, we're going to pick up now um, with the aftermath. How does Raul? continue on after such a traumatic event after uh getting literally getting shot in the in the head shattering his jaw losing his eye and and watching uh two of his friends die in in the event how and, and then raul had the bravery and the will from god to put four bullets into the uh, the attacker and end and end the attack. So we're grateful that Raul is here and Frank as well. And Raul, I just wanted to pick up uh, with you and ask you how has life been since this tragic event, and what changes have you had to make or or adjust to? I, I understand your eyesight is is probably the the first and foremost thing, but. Um, can you tell us, what, like, how does this play out after an event like that? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's been tough. That's all I can say. Like, it's it's been something that, you know, my family and I have never experienced and hope we'd never experience something like this ever again. But with that being said, uh, getting out of the hospital when I was able to actually walk and do things. First thing I did was uh, took my wife and my two daughters. We went to the gun shop, bought my wife, bought myself, and bought my daughters a firearm. Yeah. Uh, now was the time to train. And like my whole mentality has just been changing because, I mean, I'm originally from California. Uh, at the age of like 19, 20, I decided to leave. Uh, it just wasn't a Second Amendment friendly state. Uh, I was huge on firearms. They were introduced to me from my father at a young age. And, you know, he taught me everything from, you know, gun safety to, you know, just, just everything. Everything I knew. <clears throat> so just knowing that I couldn't carry, can't really shoot, can't really do anything out in California. So I decided to, to leave and I came out here to Arizona uh, just knowing that it was, uh, you know, constitutional carry state, I was, you know, religiously caring. Uh, I had two daughters at the time, and it was just like, hey, these little girls have me yeah. and only me. I must protect them with my life and everything. And if the bad people, you know, have guns, then you best believe I'm going to have a gun. That's right. Because I'm going right. to put up a fight. Isn't it amazing so, how, how our lives change when we have a kid? 
It's just oh yeah, your whole perspective, your values change, everything just changes, and and people don't understand it until they actually have a, a, a kids and, and a wife and a family. But um, so, so go go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So. <clears throat> So, yeah, so just going back to that, you know, I've been here in Arizona. I carried and, you know, I never expected anything like this to happen, but definitely was prepared for it. Yeah. Never had professional training, uh, was not in law enforcement, military or nothing. Just, you know, your average, your average Joe, I guess you can call it, you know, yeah. average dad, family man. And just, you know, just was willing to go out of his way to, you know, protect his family. You know, and so, way, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, you know, there's a, in some of these states, there's a lot of laws that, you know, we, we are so concerned with, should I pull my gun? Should I not? Is this a real attack? Is this something that I can walk away from? Because if I make the wrong move, am I going to go to jail and all this stuff? But I, I would imagine, Raul, that in, when you – when this guy came in and attacked you and your friends, I imagine you weren't thinking about all those little questions. Um, no, of course not. It was just reactive, right? Right. Yeah, you, you don't think about, am I doing the right or wrong thing? Am I right. going to go to jail? Am I going to? No. Right. The only right. thing you think about is I am willing to do whatever it takes yeah. to save them. Yeah. If I got to pay the consequences later, then that'll be my problem. That's right. What do they you say? Know, but I'd I'm rather keep uh, them alive. I'd I'd rather um, be judged by twelve than carried by carried six. by six. Right? Yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. You did the right you know, thing. If, uh, Go ahead, Frank. If I could, if I could jump in for a minute, you know, <clears throat> when when I first heard Raul tell his story to us, and we naturally had the same reaction that you know you guys have. This is for him to say he's the average dad. I think substantially minimizes the importance that he played not only in the survival of all his friends, but his family and his as of yet unborn daughter. But I wanted to call some attention to there was another hero at that party that night. And when we talk about how we react to this, we have the fight or flight mechanism, yeah. and that's what determines whether or not we're going to engage, engage and put ourselves at risk. There was a young girl at this party who grabbed an AR-15 out of a closet with no knowledge of how to use it, couldn't operate it, and she ran to the sounds of screams. And with everything she had, she the, did the only thing she could do. She swung that rifle and was hitting the assailant as many times and as hard as she possibly could. That little girl bought Raul just enough time to hear that message from God that told him, get up and get yeah. in the fight. That girl is a hero. And I don't know her name. I don't know her face. But the night that Raul told the story and I prayed for him and I prayed for his family... I prayed for that little girl that she should always have the strength and courage that she put on the display on that day because the world needs more of both of these type of people. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, and, and, and not to, not to minimize uh, Raul's wife who, who saw the, the priority at that point of saving the kids my God, it brings tears to your eyes. Just thinking about the passion that a parent has. Uh, psh, geez, unbelievable. unbelievable. You guys have any? Yeah, uh, definitely. It's, no, it's, 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 it's an amazing story that people need to hear, you know, because it's the other side of all the stuff that we're fed by the media. You know, yeah. this is the part that matters. This is the what the whole... Well, that's what the whole Constitution is about, right? Being able to protect yourself and your family in case somebody else decides to step all over your rights and try to take your life. And to take away the ability to do that is it's just criminal. You know, It's yeah. criminal. That's what we talk about all the time. You know? Well, yeah, we you talk about... You never know when it's going to happen. You yeah. never, uh, we talk about the you know uh, these uh, Democrat governors taking away, violating our Second Amendment rights and then letting prisoners out of jail. Yeah, that's uh, okay, though. 
Yeah, they don't seem to care. Criminals don't follow rules. So only, <laughs> only we um, follow rules, and we're the ones well, getting hindered to and threatened if we do anything. Yeah. Well, if I if I could add just one more thing to this whole thing, there there is another really sad caveat to this entire ordeal that Raul and his family have had to go through, and that's. Raul is a proud guy, and he's not somebody that's going to come out and say, hey, listen, I need help. But I don't have such issues <laughs> with my pride. Not when it's a matter <laughs> of trying to try to help somebody else. Raul's got a litany of medical bills, and they put up a GoFundMe for him for with a goal in mind. And this has been almost a year that it's taken place, and they have yet to hit a third of their goal. And if I could talk numbers for a minute, they have a hundred thousand dollar goal. I think to to date they've raised thirty four thousand and change for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars for a man who nearly lost his life, gave up an eye, saved twenty plus people from a mass shooter, and the Second Amendment community needs to do much better in rallying around somebody who that we could elevate to the position of this is the guy we're talking about. This is the scenario that happens. This is the hero. We have the perfect prime example of a man who defied every odd. Where is the Second Amendment community in coming out to help this man out? Yeah. Meanwhile, on the flip side, I see a story about a 75-year-old woman who's a pizza delivery lady slipped and fell on somebody's front porch and dropped the pizza. They raised $275,000 for her in under three days. Now, I'm oh. not saying that the Welcome pizza to delivery America. lady you know, didn't deserve to be able to, you know, get a nice award, but somehow I think, well, you know, maybe the guy was looking to avoid a, you know, personal injury lawsuit. Maybe that had something to do with the GoFundMe. But here we have a genuine hero, somebody that we, we should all aspire to have the kind of courage and intestinal fortitude that Raul has. And he's going to be left in the lurch financially, never going to be able to do certain things in his life again. He's not going to tell you that he has chronic migraine headaches. He's not going to tell you that he can't sleep, that he can't taste anymore, that he can't smell things anymore. His quality of life has been diminished because he took action and he saved people. This man needs to be heralded and needs to be honored by our community. We have to do more to help this man. Frank, I, I will. I will do. I will do. Let's let's start by um, let's start by how how do we uh, how do people donate to the GoFundMe? Let, give us the information now. We'll get it on. We'll put it on this show. Yeah, uh, well, there's an actual link on my Instagram. Okay. Uh, so if you go to my Instagram or you know social media platforms, there's a link on that. I should okay. be able to find it. We will find. We will find that link. And put it on, and I will. Uh, I will do everything that I can here, and we will do everything we can on the show to spread it to um, all our Second Amendment circles. And, and thank you, and, and, and thank you, Frank. Like honestly, yes, I am a proud person. I, I don't like to ask for things. I like to get try to get everything done on my own. So really appreciate it, Frank, for throwing that out there. Uh, yeah, it has been tough financially, you know, things like that. Uh, Frank is correct. You know, my right eardrum blew. I lost my sense of smell, my taste. Like, I taste a chemical all day, every day. Mm. It's it's something that I've never experienced, and I can't get it out of my mouth. Or I can't get that taste. It, although I can't smell, I'm sure they go hand in hand, but I can smell this chemical. I don't know what it is. Uh, I do suffer from, you know, chronic migraines. I get them about three, four times a week where I just literally want to crawl up, crawl into a little ball and just, you know, you know just like it's horrible. I am seeing neurology. They did uh, schedule me for an MRI, but unfortunately, I still have uh, metal fragments in my head and it's really close to some blood vessels. So they can't do the MRI scan. So they're trying to go a different route. Uh, I get vertigo from what they're telling me that vertigo, uh, possibly because of my right eardrum blue. So there's an imbalance in my body. So I'll start feeling just like dizzy and, uh, and just, mm. you know, just li little things like that. Uh, that's pretty much the aftermath of that. So I'm hoping doctors, my neurologists and everything can figure out why 
Yeah. Is there something in my brain that is struck or the impact maybe didn't hit it, but just shaking my head or the impact damaged something. But, but yeah. Well, we, we, you wouldn't, we can't tell by talking with you. And, and, and I guess that's one thing when we talk to you, we don't realize all the stuff, all the trauma you're going through uh, because we don't notice it. Uh, but, but I'm, I'm glad you, you, you told us that. And I got to tell you, you got a friend in Frank Johnson. He, Frank, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if you're getting credit with the big guy, this is where you get it because <laughs> champion <clears throat> championing that, uh, um, no? this situation. No, not, not Joe, the big guy, <laughs> the real big guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Joe, Joe can't get 10% of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not going to happen. No, well, listen, I, I am just, look, I, I was graced in my life a lot of different ways. Uh, I have had battles of my own that I didn't think I was going to pull through. And I was fortunate enough to be put on this planet. And and as many times as I can reach out and help somebody that needs help, in whatever capacity I can provide that help, I'm always going to be there to do it because I know what it's like to be somebody who's needed help and not been able to get it. And And I also know the grace of having to need help and have people to stand by me when nobody else would. And uh, Raul's story speaks to me on so many levels because I see Ra it, Raul's daughter is, uh, how old is she now? She's six months old, Raul? Uh, six months old. Uh, she, you got to right. see her, right? When we were uh, on our I, interview. I got, I, I got to see her. <laughs> I, I, see, I see that the blessing that Raul was able to get up gave life to that little girl. And I can see that when I looked at that little girl, I said, he can look at his daughter with the same love in his eyes that my parents were able to look at me when I came out, knowing that I would not have been there if somebody didn't react. And being able to put myself in that little girl's shoes, I said, he created a Second Amendment advocate that will have my story 50 years from now. Oh, so yeah. he... He created the next generation of proponent, the next generation of warrior that will go out there and continue fighting for our rights. And I can't say, you know, if I, yeah, I do a lot for people, but meeting Raul was my blessing. I don't get any blessing by helping Raul. Raul was my blessing. Hmm. I already I already got the better end of it. Well, that's awesome to hear, Frank. Yep. You're one of the good guys. And, uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, definitely. Um, uh, at least I say so on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I just want to thank both you guys for, uh, for being here uh, today. And I don't, I don't know that, I, I mean, we, we're honored to have both you guys here on the show and, uh, Raul, we wish you the best. Frank, we wish you the best, and just I, I, just thanks so much. Is there anything else you guys wanna wanna wrap up with? Um, there is something. Uh, sure. Pretty much, you know, we've been going over what what the aftermath. What's my life like now? And honestly, it was a blessing, you know, meeting Frank and just you know when he told me his story, I just felt like like wow, like it actually brought me into tears. I don't know if you you're able to see my face when we're doing that interview, and you know. I, I just felt like some type of connection, like, you know, this, this guy understands me, you know, he's a living proof. He's pretty much like my daughter, it, what's going to be, you know, in the future. So, you know, I, I'm thankful for that, you know, for meeting you here in your story and just, you know, honestly, after this happened, I, I just feel like, you know, like a new calling, you know, since, you know, mainstream media, didn't really show my story. They didn't really care because, you know, it's not in their agenda to show, you know, a good guy with a gun, you know, they want to show the statistics of, you know, what harm a firearm can do. You know, that's their agenda to yeah, just show, exactly. hey, mass shooting, you know, everybody died, 12 people died and that's it. Oh, this person died or this person that or this person, you know, just so many. I sure. If I would have died, if everybody in that house would have died, or if I wouldn't have got up and I just would have been lying there dead, you best believe that this story would have been 
all over the news. Yeah. It would have been like one of the top stories and, you know, it, yep. everybody would have known what happened. But because there was a good died. guy, because there was a good guy with a gun, they don't want, they don't want people to hear about that. It, they don't want. No. It, right. Yeah. It, it's not in their agenda to hear that, of course. And so I, given a second an opportunity in life, I feel like it's my duty uh, God gave me this opportunity and, you know, our, our, our second amendment, our freedom is a God given right. And I, I feel like it's my duty, my responsibility to continue on and, and tell this story because people have to learn from this. And I'm not going to stop until every single American knows of a living proof that a good guy with a gun, that a law abiding citizen with a firearm does save lives. And I'm going to continue I'm not going to stop. And again, you know, I really appreciate you having me on. That's just more reach for people to actually hear from the mouth of that living proof that our Second Amendment is here to stay and to protect us. And it's a God given right. Yeah. No and, government and, is, you know, should interfere and take that right from us. And we're going to share this and get this to as many people as possible. And just so you know, we are cheering you on. Um, we're, we're cheering you. you on. We 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 really uh, we really appreciate everything you uh, everything you've done for you and your family and the and the other all the other good people at the at that party that day. Um, Frank, uh, any anything else? Any final uh, comments? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll just sign off the way I sign off on the YouTube channel, and that's uh, you know be safe and shoot straight. You know, I just uh, know your rights, read your constitution, and stand up and fight. You know, the fight doesn't have to be physical. The fight can be mental, could be pen and paper, could be email. Stand and fight because unless you are actively fighting to preserve your rights, you're letting somebody else carry that weight. And we all need to do what we need to do to keep that, keep that going. Because, yeah. uh, you know, my rights are the same as yours. If, if you're not carrying your weight, you know, why are you going to put that in somebody else's hands? Get in the fight. Yeah. Join the right organizations. Support the right people. Get in there and let your voice be heard. Because I'll tell you, once your rights are gone, your voice means nothing. And Frank, how can people find you? Uh, I'm 6'3 and 275. I'm usually <laughs> easy to find. Uh, now, if you want to if, if, uh, if find me on YouTube, uh, look up the Range Report. Or if you want to find us on uh uh, Facebook, it's the Liberty First Foundation, uh, the Liberty First on Twitter, uh, the Range Report on Instagram, and we wear everywhere. You know, we, we, we're like ants. We're small, <laughs> but we're everywhere. <laughs> and, and Raul, how can people find you? And and we're gonna we're gonna put a link to your GoFundMe as well. But how I can people it. find you? The uh, link you is can... in the chat now. Okay, perfect. Uh, people can actually also find me with here this was actually my username before all this happened so i decided to just run with it it's a ga110 ent i do music so it was like a ga110 ent for entertainment so Excellent. been a musician since i was six years old so again ga110 ent.com uh that's a domain name that i was able to save and keep and that just sends you a direct you know directly to all my social media links gofundme link uh, all that good stuff. So they can follow me that way. Excellent. Well, fellas, I, I don't, I don't know how, how to thank you. I just really appreciate it. Um, really honored to have, have them, have you on the show. I, I, I just thank you so much. And uh, you guys, have any final, final comments? No, it was great. Glad to meet uh, both of yeah, you guys. And thank you so much. And people are going to see this for sure. I well, said so we we appreciate the opportunity to be here. I can speak for Raul on that, and uh, and if you guys ever feel the need, I can drop off an invite. You join us on the weekly roundtable every Friday night at nine o'clock at the Liberty First Foundation YouTube channel, uh, where we do our little weekly roundup of all the news of the week. And this will be getting a headline on the show this week. So let's do that. Let's we, do that in the next couple of weeks, Frank. Well, I'm, I'm sure we. I know Anthony said he he want to do it. John, you want to go on the show with Frank? We'll go on. Yeah. We'll go, we'll go, yeah. we'll, we'll be on your show, Frank. Good. Awesome. And this way I <clears> promise <throat> I'll have less camera difficulties <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> for, for everybody who doesn't know what happened. Well, we're going to keep that. You're better off. <laughs> you're, better <laughs> off. you're better off. We had some technical difficulties and let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Fellas, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Good thank night, you guys. so much. Thank you so much. Yes, have a great night.
Thanks so much for watching the Loaded Mike on Rumble. We're also on the Right America Media Network, Simul TV, Ops Lens, and the Key Radio Network. You can catch the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, or whatever your favorite podcast app is. I'm Dan Wass, and the Second Amendment is not a privilege. It's your right. <laughs>